It's not so much that it needs a community in the sense that there have to be lots of people, but a part of being a community is wanting to share information with each other. Might this moment resemble what happened around 50,000 years ago? The turning point that led to the explosion of human creativity? Language does not need a voice. It is our legacy, an inevitability of being human. Today, we still don't know exactly when language evolved when it opened the door to our phenomenal success as a species. This is a verb we're duplicated. But language, every language, depends on strict rules, all of them familiar. That's a roll shift to looking at man looking at the bird, then back to the man falling off the mountain, have dreaming that he's going to fly like a bird. While many species can communicate, even vocalize, only human languages are driven by complex rules. Every one of our world's 6,300 languages has them. We call them syntax. In her isolation, Mary No Name never encountered syntax. But it is commonplace in the children's language. Syntax isn't the set of rules that you learned in your third grade grammar that you had to memorize so you spoke English the way you're supposed to. Syntax is, or language, the constraints on language are something that all human beings share. They're the constraints that are imparted to us by the fact that we share a single human brain. They are the, not just the constraints, but the ability to hierarchically organize information that allows us to construct sentences, novel sentences that have never been said before, that allows us to, put, to, to tell a story, that allows us to prophecy, that allows us to lie. I can surely communicate for communication's sake when I have syntax. Then I can truly use a language. And those most gifted with the tools of language might have been the ones to prosper according to Richard Dawkins. We don't know when language started, but as soon as language did start, it provided an environment in which those individuals who were genetically best equipped to thrive and survive and succeed in an environment dominated by language were the ones who left the most offspring. And that probably, in our forefathers, that probably led to an improvement in the ability to use language. What exactly was the evolutionary purpose of language? Was it to discuss water holes, weapons, what lay over the hill? Or might it have had another advantage? The answer may be surprising. The kind of situations we're looking for to study language was just the sort of natural places where you would have a conversation in a very informal, relaxed conversation with a friend. So we kind of looked in places like bars, trains, anywhere where you would kind of um, have a sort of a natural everyday conversation. Robin Dunbar is an eavesdropper. He listens in to other people's conversations to determine what we really talk about. I think the conventional view of all those who work on language, linguists and all these kind of people, is that language is about the transmission of technically complex information. This is what I kind of call the, the Einstein and Shakespeare version of language. And the answer is, oh, no, it isn't. If you actually go and listen to what people talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, back there in their homes or on the street or over the garden fence, then it's about social relationships. The most surprising thing was actually how much time people did spend in social gossip, if you like. I mean, we, we really hadn't expected it to be so great. Social exchange of information should be important in people's lives. We really hadn't expected it to be perhaps more than about a third of total conversation time. And here we were at uh, two-thirds. 
two-thirds of all conversation Robin Dunbar believes is dedicated to gossip. Throughout human evolution, could nature have selected not just for the fittest, but for those with the most acute social skills? What language does, the bottom line, if you like, is it just allows us to hold big groups together. It's like a kind of opening a window of opportunity. Suddenly there's all sorts of other things you can do with it. Uh, because you can use it to solicit information about third parties, so you can now see what happened when you weren't actually present at the time. And the problem all monkeys and apes have is if they don't see it, they don't know about it. They never will. Gossip is certainly one of the things that language is useful for, because it's always handy to know who needs a favor, who can offer a favor, who's available, who's under the protection of a jealous spouse. And being the first to get a piece of gossip is like engaging in insider trading. You can capitalize on an opportunity before anyone else can. But language is useful for other things, for exchanging technical know-how. How do you get poison out of the gland of a toad? Uh, what's the best way to make a spear? Where are the berries? What's the best time of year to hunt? It's also good for one-on-one -on -one negotiations. If you give me some of your meat, I'll give you some of my fruit. There are all kinds of ways that language can be useful. Gossip, I think, is just one of them language, the force that created modern human culture, and that today tells us who we are, how we belong, and where we're bound. 